If you could ask any question to Tolkien, what would that be? Why did you bring Gandalf back from the dead? <laughs> He should have stayed dead. Yeah, if it had been me, Gandalf would have stayed dead. You know, bringing him back is surprising, but uh, it, in some ways it undercut the power of that moment. Putting aside his failure to acknowledge the dramatic shift that Gandalf undergoes in changing from grey to white, old Gumbo has a point. Death is one of the earliest elements we wrote into fiction, and it remains one of the most important. Among other reasons, this is because all people, except for stupid little babies, understand the effect, weight and universality of death. It's a fixture in the narratives we tell ourselves about ourselves. The real world permanence of death carries its gravitas into the fiction we invent. That's why authors can reliably expect you and me and George to feel something when Gandalf dies, or when Obi-Wan Kenobi dies, or when Dumbledore dies, or when Ned Stark dies. In some sense, there is nothing more real to us than death, so when we see it in fiction, it connects this made up nonsense about fucking wizards or whatever whatever to our real world in a potentially incomparable way. When a character defies death, they necessarily overcome their humanity. Much like in the story of Christ, something has enabled them to be free of the one thing that binds us all. Not that Gandalf was really a human to begin with, but when he returns as the white wizard, he is fundamentally different. No longer is he a jovial and whimsical champion of encouragement, Gandalf the White is a grim, dour, depressed figure of godlike authority. And George obviously understands the basic motif of death and undeath reflecting some foundational change in a person's demeanour and behaviour, having implemented the idea himself in both Beric Dondarrion and Catelyn Stark. Much of what we hear about and from Beric following his death is concerning the ways that resurrection has hollowed him, and it's clear to see the change in Lady Stoneheart's humanity upon her reintroduction to the story. It's not identical to the way Tolkien treated Gandalf, but the underlying notion is the same. Death changes you. All of this is to say, if you have a character defy death and break free from their humanity, it had better mean something. Otherwise, you've broken one of the strongest bonds between your fiction and our reality for no reason. Now, you may be wondering, but Gligar, isn't this supposed to be the funny haha laugh at the stupid dragon show series? Why would you open one of these bombastic romps with a brief introductory analysis of death and resurrection, one of the most basic and clearly understood motifs? across the entire history of fiction. Well, you see, they fucked it up. So it irritates me when I, I'm watching a movie and the hero is going through incredible dangers, him and his six buddies, and none of them die. You know, maybe one of them gets wounded at some point, but they, they all survive pretty much untouched at the end. Breaker. Jon Snow is alive again, and yeah, that's cool, you can do that. Resurrection has been established as a thing, the way it was done in the last episode was kind of weird, but yeah, we like Jon, so we like that he's alive. Not just because we like seeing him do shit, but also because we understand the thematic implications of resurrection. The story has primed us to expect a new Jon, reforged in the crucible of death. Additionally, past episodes have indicated to us that this should radically change Melisandre, and in Home, Davos exhibited a willingness to forego a central ideal of his in service of reviving Jon. So the three main characters involved in this are all set up to demonstrate how this miraculous event has changed them, their values, and the way they see and interact with the world. Just like when introducing a new character, in a situation of great change like this, it's so important to quickly establish what we have to understand about these people. I propose that this program's paramount purpose at this point is to provide people with a new perspective on its protagonists. So let's have a look at how Earthbreaker handles Jon Snow. John. At first, John seems shocked and confused that he's alive before realising that there's a bunch of holes in his lungs. Then he has a panic attack or he registers the physical pain he's in, or both, both works. His first words as a reborn man are, They stopped me. Ollie, put a knife in my heart. This is 
fine. Like, sure, you would be reflecting on this, but this also signals to us that our new undead John is focused on his death. They stopped me. The inhumanity surrounding it. Ollie. And the unnatural nature of his renewed life. Put a knife in my heart. John doesn't believe he should be alive, which may foretell of a future personal struggle of trying to find meaning in his rebirth, which is reinforced when he tells Melisandre he experienced nothing while dead. There was nothing at all. Episode 1 basically says that John is the prince who was promised, which uh, I'll get into later. Big Jongus asks Davos why he's back, and he ends the scene by concluding that he's a failure. The big picture across this first scene, then, is that John wants to find a new meaning behind a big loser like him being brought back from death. Overall, our new John is brooding in search of confidence and bears the weight of the world on his shoulders. And do you see the fucking problem yet? This isn't a new John, and I know it's it's only been one scene, but it's the most important scene, and all you've shown us is that this is the same guy. Okay, you may disagree with that, so let me put it like this. Let's imagine that John hadn't died in Mother's Mercy, but for whatever reason he was imprisoned by the mutineers, and over the last two episodes Ed and Davos and Tormund worked to set him free. Now picture the analogous scene to this one in that alternate story. John has just escaped and is now reflecting on what happened, having been betrayed and imprisoned by his brothers just for doing what he thought was right. Your your mileage may vary, but my vision of that scene has John brooding in search of confidence, bearing the weight of the world on his shoulders. He is at a loss for meaning knowing how his brothers treated him for merely following his own values. He admits failure and shows a lack of will to go on. Aside from the context of death, Nothing changes. Seriously, think through the rest of the story and replace John's death with something else and so little changes. You may think that the times he shows no fear towards death are only possible after resurrection, but remember that he had shown similar attitudes towards fatal situations long before he was stabbed to death. Think of how completely different John could have been. Think of Catelyn Stark, a loving mother who becomes a demonic vessel of vengeance. Of Gandalf, the cheery, whimsical chain smoker who becomes the emissary of the Valar, and fucking Anakin Skywalker, Mr. Edgy Emo Boy who becomes an evil robot space wizard. Then think of Jon Snow who becomes slightly grumpier, and the Emperor who becomes the Emperor. God, what a shit movie. I'm the spy. I did. Just as they did with Bran, the writers had a perfect opportunity to completely reinvent this character, and they used it to give him a haircut. Two nickels isn't much, but it's weird that it happened twice. Jon sees the Night's Watch, complete with a bunch of people who were complicit in his murder, but don't worry, we only need to execute three guys and a child. Then we get the most promising exchange in the episode. They think you're some kind of god. I'm not a god. Oh no, they might actually go anywhere with John's resurrection affecting him and his story. What kind of god would have a peck of that small? Ah, not to worry. It was just a setup for another dick joke. Thank Tyrion, that was a close one. Tormund has been flanderized, by the way, but we'll get into that next time. They think you're some kind of god. You can make a religion out of this. It asks what I was wondering when I first watched the episode. Is that still you in there? And John confirms my greatest fears. I don't think so. It is presented in the context of him being a white, but it still annihilates me. Yes, it's still the same John in there. Yes, this whole death thing could have been replaced with any other struggle. Yes, we don't give a shit about these characters. And to illustrate why this is a world-building failure, in addition to being a thematic narrative and character failure, consider that we're told both John and Beric are revived by the will of the Lord of Light, much like how whites, those zombie dudes you can kill with any weapon, are revived by the will of the Night King. Perfect opportunity to explore how and why and in what ways these two analogous things are different or the same, but of course that's never addressed. John is, as Gurm himself may put it, a fire white, and yet he looks and behaves just like a regular person. Later, and yes, this is the next time we see any of these people, John executes some guys. Out of the at least 12 mutineers, the six stabbers, and the shit ton of people complicit in seizing the castle with Alyssa, John has decided to execute four people. Okay. No clue who these jagweeds on the left are, but we've got a cranky child who couldn't conceive that there would be consequences for his actions, and Ollie. This little piggy tells John he's an abomination, this little piggy wants to cowardly lie about how he died, this little piggy defends racism, and this little piggy just pouts. We've seen John execute men for far less than this, but killing a child is a step towards a darker, vengeful John. In spite of how horrific this is, I'm told that a lot of people cheered for this child's death, similar to how many celebrated 
Joffrey's death. And, you know, Joffrey was thoroughly established as a monster in many ways, so that's more understandable, but poor Ollie was driven to extreme action by unenviable circumstances. Given that so many grown men who also participated in his crimes walk free, this seems truly unjust. Well, being annoying is not an executable offense. Anyway, John plays a reverse card on Ed and gives him his cloak, which isn't at all special, and tells him, You have got so black. Which is absolutely not a thing he can do, but whatever. He declares, My watch is ended. And the episode ends as he walks out of the courtyard, abandoning the watch so that he can pursue his own personal issues. Except, of course, he doesn't do any of that. The passage he walks through is internal, he never leaves the castle, and so this dramatic way of ending the episode is a trick, really, to make you think the story gave you more than it actually did. All this interesting development for John is never expanded upon, and gets dropped at the earliest opportunity in the next episode. Classic season 6 move. When all's said and done, John is resoundingly unchanged by the experience of death. So the grand effect of this entire arc where he fucking comes back from the dead is a way to kill off Alistair and Ollie. Great usage of your main character's death and resurrection, fellas. Good work. Oh, and I guess John is free from his oath now, kinda, technically, but also not. So yeah, there you go. That's how Oathbreaker handles its most important task of reintroducing Jon Snow. In a word, lackluster. And in around 1300 words or so, you know, all that stuff I just said. Davos. At first, Dave seems shocked and confused that John's alive, but he pulls himself together in time to give the zombie a blankie. He does fail to provide a hot cocoa, however. It always struck me as odd that they started the episode with Davos looking on at John. I think it fits better for John to re-enter the world with just Ghost by his side, but whatever. At the outset, Davos isn't much of an actor in this scene. He just kind of facilitates John and Melisandre talking, but he tells her to fuck off after she brings up Stannis because he feels embarrassed that he doesn't have a reason for not thinking about Stannis. Like, hey, shh, don't mention him. They'll start asking questions about why we're doing the things we're doing. He tells John, hey, look, you're a zombie now, and that's weird, but sometimes you just gotta roll with the punches. Nah, I quite like old Davy telling John O to keep on fighting to fix as much of the world as possible. That does fit in with what we know about him. What I don't like is this. Why? I don't know. Maybe we'll never know. Which, sure, for the character it works, but it rubs me the wrong way when I think of it as the writer's hand-waving all of these questions. I would also expect to see some kind of shift in Davos' take on religion, given that a god he previously despised just brought a man back from the dead, but we never see that. Instead, Davos carries on about his business as though nothing much has impacted him, in spite of the deaths of the king he swore his life to, that king's daughter who he loved, I loved that girl, and this guy he kinda knew, sorta. This is the craziest week of Davos Seaworth's life. Basically everything he knew has been uprooted, and yeah, he's just he's just hanging out. I, I don't know, man, I just expect something from him. God, it's just weird how they sneakily tagged him onto John without explanation, and then that was that for the whole rest of the damn show. So while they pissed out the smallest possible amount of change in Jon Snow, the ultimate effect of all this on Davos Seaworth is that he hot-swapped the boots he was licking. Melisandre. At first, Melisandre seems shocked and confused that John's alive, but uh, yeah, that's mostly it. Understandably, she interrogates him about what happens after death, hoping to hear a more satisfying answer than what Beric told her. She scribbles his response down in her little clipboard before saying, The Lord let you come back for a reason. Stannis was not the prince who was promised, but someone has to be. Which is a shitty post hoc take on why Stannis is dead. The general consensus among fans is that the blood sacrifice of Shireen enabled Melisandre to resurrect Jon, not that this is ever addressed or explored by Melisandre, who should probably be super interested in how the fuck all of this works. But even if it's not the case, Melisandre attributes Stannis' failure to return from the dead to the will of God, even though she didn't even fucking try. And Davos, who is currently in the room, decides decided to go to her about resurrecting John for some reason. I know I keep mentioning this, and I'm going to continue mentioning it, because it's an extremely important point that changes so much it has absolutely no explanation. Here's another big issue that isn't scene specific, but rather one of those ones that just hangs over the whole show. After resurrecting John, Melisandre does fuck all throughout the entire season, until the finale when she is politely asked to leave, please. Really, after this scene, she participates in half a conversation 
conversation with Davos in episode 4, tells Jon she doesn't care about his wishes in episode 9, and then She was good, she was kind, and you killed her! Like with Davos, they're so attached to her status quo, so caught up in building to this one scene at the end of the season, that they can't commit to anything else happening to these characters. This priestess just resurrected a man who she thinks is the prophesied saviour of mankind, and she sits around twiddling her thumbs for an entire season. Shouldn't this be her moment in the sun? Previously she'd shown immense religious fervour centred on a man who turned out to just be a man? But now that she's gone and raised the fucking dead, she's run off to play tiddlywinks in the Castle Black Rec Room with the rest of them. But yeah, this is the best season of Game of Thrones, don't worry about it. Have you seen the cinematics in the battle? It totally makes up for the characters being turned into cardboard cutouts. Alice with Thorn. I fucking swear we're almost done with Castle Black. Just real quick, we're gonna talk about Alice of Thorn's last words. While not as important functionally as first words, final words in a sense shape a character's legacy. Or more broadly, final actions do. Given how the last two episodes utterly pulverized this character, <laughs> his last speech has a lot of work to do if the show wants me to feel satisfied with Alice of Thorn. Wisely, the writers choose to ignore everything Alice did after the mutiny when summarizing this conflict having Alice stand by his decision to murder Jon with the motive of upholding the Watcher's supposed purpose of keeping the wildlings north of the walrus. Then he poses himself and his fate in contrast to Jon's. A fought, a lost, now a rest. But you, Lord Snow, you'll be fighting their battles forever. I really like this. Unlike the slimy weasel next to him, or Janna Slint, Alyssa maintains his principles, accepts his death, and even throws in a shade of pity towards Jon in his undeath, an angle that hadn't been looked at yet. It seems that Thorn understands the struggle Jon should be facing as a consequence of this, more than anyone else. He dies with a sense of pride, unwavering in spite of a god telling him that Jon should not be dead. This speech doesn't quite redeem the illogical catastrophe that wrecked Atlas of Thorn in season 6, but it does send him off in such a way that I can think about him and overall consider... Yeah, that's a good character. Okay, let's get the fuck out of here now. Samuel. Holy shit, it's Sam. Remember Sam? Yeah, well he's on a ship now, being a little bitch, as is tradition. Gilly continues delivering cute little lines about her literacy journey. See, see. They're spelled different, but they sound the same. It's a homophone! And it's a shame that this is only ever relevant during one scene in season 7 and impacts nothing thereafter. I also like to think that she was saying this insane crap to distract Sam from his sickness. That's cute. But then she goes ahead and brings it up anyway, I guess. In spite of having left four entire episodes ago, Sam tells Gilly only now that she won't be able to live at the Citadel. Like they're this far along their journey and he hasn't mentioned this extremely important information yet. What a little dick brain. He figures that his mega racist father, who once banished and threatened to murder him, his son, will allow Gilly to live at Horn Hill because she's family. Yeah, dude, I don't know. Anyway, this kid's supposed to be three. That's not a three year old. You ready? We're gonna do the thing again. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to How Old Is This Baby? Hey, mum, is this a three year old? No. See, I told you. Thanks for playing. How old is this baby? Gilly agrees to go along with Sam's plan and he says, I'd feel better if you threw something at me and stormed off. Which is so weird. Sam hadn't been in a relationship before Gilly who has never done anything like this and we later meet his mother and sister who don't seem the sort to do this kind of thing and yet somehow Sam has internalized this dramatic trope. Is it supposed to be funny? I'm just confused. Why would Sam prefer his girlfriend disagreeing with what he thinks is safe for her? You're weird. Bran. Long, long ago, the showrunners decided that they wouldn't be adapting the many dreams or flashbacks throughout A Song of Ice and Fire, except for the Maggie one, I guess. Having realised that the Tower of Joy Dream is actually kind of really important, it turns out, they chucked it in here five years after it would have happened in season one, so that when you get to the season finale, you're not utterly baffled by what's going on. To their credit, this scene feeds two birds with one scone, showing the audience that this conflict happened, while also cheekily introducing time-ish tragedy. Travelish. However, it also gruesomely drowns a basket full of hamsters by presenting all of this without any context. Having failed to establish Arthur Dane at all, aside from mentioning his name in passing once in season 4, the writers make him at all noteworthy by giving him two swords as an homage to the season 4 episode. 
two swords. Instead of focusing on the one epic sword that's supposed to make him noteworthy. There's also no presented reason for why Max von Sydow is showing Bran this moment. For all I know, he just wanted to see a cool fight because they leave as soon as it ends, again for no stated reason. The Three-Eyed Raven is such an awful character, mainly because he isn't one. He's a device through which the writers can deliver exactly what information they want the audience to have, and they think they can get away without working it into the plot or Bran's character. So why did Bran and not Blood Raven watch this fight, and why did they watch it now, and why did they leave instead of following Ned into the tower, and why is it important that Bran doesn't know he can affect the past? The answer to literally all of these questions is to build drama. It's to craft the plot they want. These characters aren't doing anything for any actual reason. What's in the tower? That's enough for one day. Yeah man, it'll be way better if you don't go in there until the finale. They fucking know they're in a show! <laughs> At the very least, Dane wears a helmet, so I have that to be thankful for. Cheeseburger. God, these two assholes are so obnoxious in the flashback scenes. They feel the need to formally introduce everyone of relevance to the audience. That's my father. The man beside him is Howland Reed, Mira's father. Sir Arthur Dane. The sword of the morning. As though these things can't be naturally told to us through the conversation that is about to take place. Could you imagine if during the Maggie the Frog scene that opens season 5, Bran and this old guy were off on the sidelines making commentary the whole time? Whoa, that's Queen Cersei. Yes, and that's her childhood friend, Malara Heatherspoon. Why have I never heard of her before? <laughs> Just watch Brandon. <laughs> That's exactly what's happening here. I don't need Bran to tell me that Neil Patrick Harris over here is Ned. Arthur Dane tells me 40 seconds later in a completely natural way. Lord Stark. Beyond this, how the fuck does Bran know that this is Arthur Dane? <laughs> Why doesn't he say, wow, that's... Um, is it Gerald Hightower or Oswell Went? Fuck. You know, in that season 4 scene, the white book says that Arthur, Gerald, and Oswell were all there. My, that's an embarrassing thing to fuck up. Arthur quotes season 5 to Ned, as all true lovers do. I wish you good fortune in the wars to come. I wish you good fortune. In the wars to come. Bran, be careful! If you die in the exposition flashback, you die in real life! The fight itself looks cool. Yeah, sure. I'm no battleologist, so I might have missed some legitimate grievances beyond the silly dual wielding. And like, sometimes they do that video game thing where a bunch of opponents attack you one at a time. But hey, it looks pretty cool when you replace them with lightsabers, I guess. Fucking nerds, man. You are right behind him! Kill him! What are you doing? He's better than my father. Yes. I can already see that brand, but thank you for telling me. And apparently he's heard the story a thousand times. Heard the story a thousand times. Yet we, the audience, are learning all of this for the first time just now, in spite of Bran spending years traveling with the children of the other survivor of this fight. Wait, actually. Your father is Howland Reed. Yeah. Saved my father's life during the rebellion. Okay, they, they did mention it. Fair enough, but... Your father beat him. Wait, so which is it? Does he know the story? Heard the story a thousand times. Saved my father's life during the rebellion. Or does he not? Your father beat him. This fucking show, man, I swear to God. Anyway, Howland yeets a dagger into Arthur's back and for some reason Bran thinks that this is just terrible. How dare he? Wow, in the back, Howland. Dude, uncool, you should have just let him kill my dad. Bran calls out to Ned and a waste of a brilliant actor looks super concerned as though he doesn't want Bran to know that he can interact with the past even though his survival in two episodes time is entirely dependent on this fact. Again, he is only withholding information for the sake of building suspense for the viewer. It only makes sense if he is fully aware that he's part of a TV show. Maybe he is fucking Arbed. Bran and Raven in a cave! So yep, I hate that scene. This Bran plot is nothing more than a vehicle for exposition, and I'm pretty sure the drivers are drunk. I've got some exposition for you! <laughs> Your favourite! But before you leave, you must learn. Learn what? Everything. Oh, is that why you're actively withholding information from him, you hat. Now, Max von Sydow is great, but I kind of wish they'd stuck with Struan Roger, whose appearance was way more mystical and ethereal. He looked a lot more like a spooky wizard, I guess. Anyway, Daenerys. After almost five years doing 
some other stuff, Daenerys finally returns to Vaes Dothrak, and the local government has clearly been hyper-focused on urban remodeling. Was there something wrong with the previous Vaes Dothrak? Kyle over here brings Dan to this mega dome building that represents an organized religion, where for the crime of exercising her freedom as a woman, she is bitterly chastised and stripped of her individuality. Hey, look at me, I'm understanding subtext. The ensuing conversation is kind of a reality check concerning Drogo, every other Khaleesi who thought that they would mother the stallion who does some things, and Danny's entitlement to be above the systems of the society she participates in. Consider that not only does she defy Dothraki society by not becoming Dosh Kaleen, she also defies Giskari society by abolishing slavery, and she defies Westerosi society by seeking despotism, and by blowing a bunch of people up. And she kind of defies Carthine society too by not wearing the boob dress. Anyway, look, yeah, it's fine. Nothing is necessarily wrong with the scene. Not too much happens in it, aside from this priestess telling us that this new Khala Veshven thing is happening, and that's why all the Khals are coming to Veyas Dothrak. But then didn't Khal Moro only come here to drop off Daenerys? Like from that scene in Melisandre, the realization that Danny had to go to Veyas Dothrak looked like it meant something to Moro, like he would have had to go out of his way for it. But if he was already coming here for this thing, then it shouldn't have really mattered? Or did he just now call for the big dumb meeting? Can he do that? I just feel like a single line in that scene where someone mentions this would go such a long way to making this not feel extremely rushed, slapped together on the spot just to provide a way for Danny to kill all of them later on. But of course, that's what it was. This episode is just riddled with feverish attempts to set up later events. Varys. Varys meets with a sex worker and you know what, it's not all that bad. Mainly because Conleth is great and he spends this scene miraculously unimpeded by awkward dialogue and dick jokes. It's also good that this isn't just some random. Vala was a part of the Harpy's attacks last season, but given how she just appears out of nowhere and hasn't been seen in almost an entire season, it does seem a little out of nowhere. It'd be useful to have the Unsullied who bring her in tell us who this is, how they found her, and what she's done, but whatever. I know you want to make Varys seem omniscient by knowing her and her son's names, but that's like... What? How if he's just now being presented with her? Or was she captured like a few days ago to allow him to do his research? Then why would he act so smug about knowing these things? Beyond this, it's great fun to see some good old fashioned blackmailing. This is the first time in a long while that Varys has been more than just Tyrion's straight man. It's good to see that the show hasn't completely forgotten that this guy is willing to do fucked up shit to accomplish his goals. You did conspire to kill the Queen's soldiers. Dude, her actions led to Barristan's death. Mention Barristan! You know nobody mentions him at all after season 5? Children are blameless. I have never heard them. This guy organized the assassination attempt on a 16 year old Daenerys in season 1 and he fully intended on that plot succeeding. I don't intend on embarking upon yet another rant about what childhood actually means but this is fishy and plays into some notion that Varys is completely full of shit seeing as this is the first time we've seen him without Tyrion in ages and he's being weird. Of course we know in retrospect that he's not. I'm just doing a thing, don't worry about it. Tyrion. And then we have a terrible scene. Just awful. Tyrion is fucking insufferable, while Grey Worm and Missande are planks of wood. Please remove this scene, it adds nothing but an extra paragraph to my suicide note. A wise man once said, the true history of the world is a history of great conversations in elegant rooms. Who said this? Me. Just now. How is this smarmy c supposed to be at all sympathetic when he's pulling shit like this? Yeah, it's marketable, but holy shit, can you please stop consuming the soul of Tyrion Lannister? The only joy I can extract from this scene is in watching Jacob Anderson's grumpy face. Varys eventually comes to the rescue, but honestly, the earth-shattering revelation that the masters of Yunkai, Astapor, and Volantis are funding the Sons of the Harpy is so mind-numbingly boring and predictable, I kinda wish he never showed up. Was anybody surprised by this? Does this mean anything to anyone? It's so fucking simple that when this season was coming out, I had to think that Varys was lying, or that Valor had duped him, or something. Because, you know, this is Game of Thrones. And surely the solution to a mystery as pivotal as the Sons of the Harpy couldn't be that easy. If the Unsullied march off to reconquer Astapor and Yonkai, who remain to defend the free people of Marine? You know, 
when I was growing up, they taught me that there's no such thing as a stupid question, but there goes one right now. I don't know, Tyrion, how about Danny's Khalasar? Or the second sons? You know, that spare army Danny had sitting around? Or did you want us to kind of forget about that one? Missande tells Tyrion that the slavers will only respond to violence, and he straight up ignores her advice and asks Varys to set up a meeting between them. Not saying he should immediately agree with her and jump to war, but after admitting You may be right. He completely discounts everything she says, even though she's been in this situation and this society for much longer than he has. Varys says, yeah, I can schedule a luncheon, citing his birds. And then we cut to... <sighs> we cut to all his little birds that he abandoned in King's Landing. Again, Varys must be fucking omnipotent to do all this without his established spy network. But also, why would you need a spy network to organize a basic diplomatic parlay? Cersei. In his creepy basement, Kyburn gives treats to all the little children. All this shit with him and the old little birds is fine, reinforcing Kyburn as both a figure of grandfatherly kindness and a twisted manipulator. If any of your friends like sweets or need help, they can always come to me. Cersei sees the need to bring Slippery Jim and Big Greg down to Kyburn's creepy lab. I do love how Kyburn introduces the landform that rises prominently above its surroundings to the children. That's cute. This is Sir Gregor. He's friends with all my friends. However, it's weird that they're not even pretending that this isn't Gregor. Like, it's just public knowledge that Kyburn Frankensteined a dude. Jamie turns on a lamp. What did you do to him exactly? I haven't been able to get a clear answer. But Kyburn plops a shade right over it. Oh, uh, a number of things. Jamie wants Gregor to do the thing he was too much of a bitch to do last episode, and we're told that that won't work. Then there's talk of a drive-by wombat that Jamie hypes up because he rates Clegane Bowl. Cersei tells Mr. Burns that she wants little birds everywhere, which, along with all the other worthwhile plot points, goes nowhere. Then there's the council meeting where Pycelle farts. It's useful at a moment like this to think about all the incredible moments this show has given us, as a reminder of why we endure this. Pycelle farts? Don't worry, think about Peter's betrayal of Ned. Tyene posts cringe? Red Wedding, you'll be alright. They completely botched Jon Snow's resurrection? Yeah, sorry, we don't have anything for that. Look, the meeting isn't terrible, and Kevin's a champion of course, and we love Ace Tyrell in this house, but it is strange seeing these supposedly competent adults acting with such pettiness. Jamie is completely right when he says, We've got a lot to discuss. All of us, together. And yet this group of people, whose actions we never hear of by the way, just storm out. It's funny and not much else, at a time where much else would be appreciated. Tommen. Back in the most exciting location known to man or beast, Tommen confronts Frank. Tommen is angry at first, which I like, but then he's so easily placated when Frank destroys him with facts and logic. He's so gung-ho when he comes in, but the High Sparrow just says, your mum has flaws. And that's that, he's straight back to being easily manipulated, useless little Tomba. That wasn't a full atonement. No. <laughs> This guy's making shit up as he goes along, I fucking swear. So, in this scene, the High Sparrow uses Cersei's love for Tommen as an excuse for keeping her away from her family, and Tommen backs down because he's supposed to listen to the gods? Isn't this the same Tommen who, just last episode, got all riled up about keeping his family together? I just feel like this plot, the whole King's Landing plot, mind you, is simply treading water, pointlessly meandering to nowhere very slowly, until suddenly the writers decide that it's time to go somewhere. Tommen wasn't placated by the High Sparrow's great philosophizing or his tactful manipulation. No, he was placated by lazy writers who needed him to not change the status quo so that they could do a thing later on. <sighs> I have just one thing to say to you. Arya. At the house of something or other, Arya undergoes a ninja training montage wherein she gets hit with a stick, she sniffs some stuff, and she talks about how she isn't who she is, but also is who she is. They're pretty consistent in separating Arya Stark from a girl, except at the end they use the two identities interchangeably. Who else was on Arya Stark's funny little list? Cersei Lannister, Gregor Clegane, Walder Frey. That's a short list. That can't be everyone you want to kill. 
Like, I thought the point was that this isn't Arya, but then again, I only think that because I had to invent a point for all of this because the show doesn't provide one. The montage does a good job of conveying the passage of time, and the scene culminates with her offering to kill a target, which is a fine dramatic ending, but then it cuts directly to this other scene where Jack and unblindens her? It really feels like these scenes should have been separated, not only for the episode's pacing, but also for the plot's logic. Like, why would he do this when all Aya has done to prove her loyalty is get walloped and win at the bullshit lying game? What was the point of blinding and evicting her in the first place if you were only going to invite her back and unblind her before she's even done anything for you? Why is the house of this and that even interested in Aya when she's only ever been a liability for them? Why am I asking these questions that I know will never receive answers? Why haven't you hit the like button yet? Ramsey. Small John Umber presents Ramsey with Osha and Rickon because he felt it had been too long since something insane had happened at Winterfell. He was wrong, but let's go over it anyway. Small John proposes a Bolton Umber alliance because there are now wildlings south of the Walrus and he needs help fighting them off. This is apparently worth Ramsey's wild because the wildlings could pose a threat to Winterfell if Jon Snow were leading them. Yes, this is actually the plot of the scene. Forgetting for a moment that Ramsey's proposed plan for dealing with Jon was to just murder to him. This alliance is predicated on the ludicrous notion that Ramsay would need help to defend Winterfell from the Lord Commander of the Night's Watch abandoning his post to somehow become the leader of a wildling army so he can conquer the North. A ridiculously specific and outlandish chain of circumstances. Now, you might be thinking, Glinko, that's exactly what happens. But not only is that post hoc, it also only happens because Ramsay goads Jon in the next episode. In his own words, Jon was done fighting I'm tired of fighting. And it's that letter that gets him involved in the first place. Ah, but Smuldjin gave Ramsay the heir to Winterfell, you might suppose. That's why he accepted the alliance. But no, that's not what happened. Pledge your banners to House Bolton. Swear loyalty to me as Warden of the North. And we will fight together to destroy the bastard and all his wildling friends. This happens before Umber reveals Rickon. He only gives Ramsay the heir to Winterfell as a gift in lieu of him pledging fealty traditionally? This is a first fucking draft, I swear to god. Why wouldn't this asshole use his possession of the last known child of Ned Stark to secure a far more favourable position than guy who dies in battle? Having Rickon Stark is such a game changer for anyone, and he just pointlessly hands him to Ramsay even though he was already happy to accept the alliance. Why write this? Holy shit dude, just have Ramsay refuse to help until Small John offers Rickon. Are you fucking daft? Aside from this, there's also the minor issues of Small John hating his father for no given reason even though he was tops. The king in the north! Osha and Rickon having just fucked around for two and a half years and Ramsay accepting that this is indeed Rickon Stark simply because he is presented with a puppy's severed head. They couldn't give Rickon any lines because Art Parkinson was 14 at this point and Rickon was supposed to be 11, so he's just forced to look around all panicky and it's not the kid's fault but it looks so dumb. Dumb. He's also way too tall, and I'm forced to wonder why they didn't recast him if they were going to have Small John explain who he was anyway. So yeah, that's some good old Rush setup again right over here over there, isn't it then? Oh, that's it. That's all the scenes. I guess we're done. CONCLUSION! You know, seeing the episode's title, I thought it was going to be a play on Oath Keeper, the fourth episode of season four, and of course, Brienne's Valyrian seal sword and the notion of honour, oaths, and the Jaime dilemma. I thought that this episode would finally see Brienne admit fault and maybe face some consequences for her reckless behaviour, like maybe Sansa somehow finds out that Brienne abandoned her post, putting her life at huge risk. She finds out by cozying up to Podrick, why not? But no, that entire plot line doesn't even exist in this episode, and instead the title is just in reference to Jon leaving the walrus, which he doesn't even do, and isn't necessarily even an oath breaking. So yeah, that sucks. I guess the episode also mentions that Danny was supposed to go to the Dosh Khalin after Drogo's death, and that might be an oath breaking, and maybe Howland's apparently dishonourable attack on Arthur Dane is- no, that's dumb. This is dumb. The whole thing is dumb, and aside from an absolutely botched resurrection arc and a cool fight scene that makes no sense, Oathbreaker is entirely forgettable. Thanks for watching. Episode 4, soon. And here's some people who paid me to read their names. 
Suckers. Agler here. Lord Og. Avery Lane. Dylan Bell. M. Hell the Orange. Ingvold. Overarm. Jamez. Joshy Bear. More Moths. Nurse Ratchet. Richard. Samsum. Shrimper Jr. Simcoe. Stay78. STL Guna. Waffle. Yen. And. Ondi. They just keep coming. Before too long, they'll take up half the runtime of these videos. If I had a nickel for every time Glidus said, if I had a nickel for every time this strangely specific thing happened, I'd have two nickels, which isn't much, but it's weird that it happened twice in this series. I'd have two nickels, which isn't much, but it's weird that it's happened three times now.